Let us uh, welcome the first speaker, provide, uh, Professor uh, uh, K.Y. Yun. Uh, he's a well-known figure. Um, uh, he's a Henry Falk Professor in Infectious uh, Diseases, uh, Chair of Infectious Disease in the Depart Department of Microbiology. Uh, in the outbreak of avian flu H5N1 in 1997 in Hong Kong, uh, Professor Yun was the first to report in Lancet about the unusual clinical severity and high mortality of infected uh, patients. During the outbreak of SARS in 2003, his team discovered the SARS uh, coronavirus. He is currently one of the advisors advising the Hong Kong government on COVID-19 outbreak. So over to you, uh, Professor Yun. Good morning, everybody. I'm K. Van Yun from the Department of Microbiology, and this is uh, here what uh, the COVID-19 coronavirus looks like in the electron microscopy. Uh, you can see that it has some surface projections, uh, which, are, which is called the uh, spike projections. Uh, this contains the receptor binding domain and allows the virus to enter our human cell and then lead to infection. And we come down with COVID-19 uh, because of this virus with this spike protein projection. Well, now Hong Kong's airport is more empty than 2003. Uh, the COVID-19 has uh, caused over 3 million cases with 2 million deaths within just four months. Whereas the 2003 SARS uh, caused around 8,000 cases uh, with around 900 deaths within six months. And the global economic loss of 2003 is estimated to be about 40 billion uh, US dollar. Um, the key questions now that we have is, first, can we predict what would, when would be the end of the COVID-19? Uh, what is the final morbidity, mortality and economic loss so that we can now act to reduce the physical and psychosocial impact? The second key question is to find and control the source of the virus so that it will not recur. Our Hong Kong U team found the bad SARS coronavirus uh, HKU3, which is ancestrally related to the 2003 SARS coronavirus in the Chinese hospital beds in 2005 operation PNAS. And this Chinese hospital bed turns out to be the animal origin of the 2003 SARS coronavirus as been confirmed by many groups from mainland China and other parts of the world. Two years later, in 2007, we published a review on SARS in the Clinical Microbiology Review. In our concluding paragraph of should we be ready for the re-emergence of SARS, we wrote, the presence of a large reservoir of SARS coronavirus-like viruses in hospital beds, together with the culture of eating exotic mammals in southern China, is a time bomb. The possibility of the emergence of the SARS and other novel viruses from animals and labor or laboratories, and therefore the need for preparedness, should not be ignored. Since then, our department has positioned ourselves for this COVID-19 epidemic for the last 13 years. This is the phylogenetic tree showing the relatedness of different coronaviruses, including the human common cold coronaviruses, the MERS coronaviruses, and of course the bad coronavirus. You can see that the SARS coronavirus 2, which caused the COVID-19, belong to the whole group of bad SARS-related coronaviruses. But we still do not know what is the ancestral virus of this SARS-CoV-2. We do not know the annual reservoirs and how did it evolves into the present SARS coronavirus 2. And what are the factors driving the evolution? And how does this virus jump the species barrier? The focus of our research should be on finding the viruses which is related to this SARS-CoV-2 from animal surveillance in the wild, in the farms, and in the markets. And we should harness the animal and human organoid technology to assess the species jumping potential of these animal viruses to predict the next pandemic virus. 
Our team has harvested the atom stem cell from the Chinese also bat intestine and developed the intestinal organoid from the bat. We call it the bat android. These are balls of intestinal tissue with the representative cell types with corresponding physiological function. And you can see that these bat androids support the, support the growth of the SARS coronavirus tube very well. With both this bat android and also the human airway organoid, we can assess the potential of any bat virus crossing the species barrier by growing the bat virus first in the bat android and then select out the potential species jumping bat virus jump that can jump into the human airway by using by looking at its growth in the human airway organoid. Our team first found a family cluster of COVID-19 on patients in the Hong Kong Yushinjin Hospital and documented person-to-person -person transmission. This is the first documentation published in Lancet. Now, these are the computerized lung scans showing multiple peripheral brown glass changes in the lungs of these patients. We soon realized that the SARS-CoV-2 are found inside the lungs, especially in severely ill patients, and not necessarily found inside the nose or throat. So without putting in a bronchoscope into the lungs of the patient, how can we obtain good specimen for diagnostic testing? Well, taking the nasal pharyngeal or throat swab is what is being done most of the time in most countries, and that need, a, need, that need a lot of these swabs, which are in shortage, and also trained personnel. The genetic test that we are using, a genetic amplification test called RT-PCR, takes two to three hours, and it needs to be run by trained staff. We found that asking patients to clear the throat by coughing up before breakfast and mouth rinsing in the early morning can be just as effective and accurate. And we can show that there is a high viral load in this, what we call deep throat saliva, even in the early course of illness. Because the throat is the meeting point where the lung secretions are moved up from below and the nasopharyngeal secretions that come down into the throat uh, in the early morning time, uh, just when we just uh, awake. And that is very important because by just clearing the throat and get this deep throat saliva, we are able to get secretions representing from both the upper and lower respiratory tract. And um, this would avoid swap supply shortage, it decreases patient discomfort, and most importantly, decreases the infectious risk to our healthcare workers, uh, which you know that when you are taking these swaps, it will induce sneezing and coughing, and that makes the health workers vulnerable. But up to this stage in time, unfortunately, there is no rapid and accurate point of care test that can test not just the COVID-19 virus, but also all the other respiratory viruses. You know that if you know that it is influenza and not COVID-19, then it is safe really to discharge the patient and put the patient out of isolation, but not yet at this stage. Can we have a rapid and accurate blood test for early diagnosis. At this stage in time, we are still using a fragment of the surface spike protein projections of this coronavirus called receptive binding domain um, to test for antibody level in the blood of COVID-19 patients. We find that antibody level is only reliably detected after around 10 to 14 days. Thus, they still do not have a rapid and accurate blood test for making an early diagnosis at this stage. What is important is that we recently use some small strips of lung tissue donated by patients. Um, and if you challenge this lung tissue uh, with the SARS coronavirus infection, we found that actually our lung tissue cells do not mount a good antiviral response 
such as the interferon uh, beta, uh, and also uh, other inflammatory response markers. So it's actually the virus induced very little inflammation and antiviral response, markedly less than the 2 series free SARS coronavirus. And this explained why there are so many mild coronavirus uh, COVID-19 cases which are fueling the present pandemic and also raised an important question whether we can use this interferon beta for treatment of these patients. So, do we have a good antiviral for treating COVID-19? Not yet. But at the moment, we are trying to use what we call repurposed drugs, uh, which are already available commercially, but are originally used for treating other infections. And we are also using the blood plasma, which continue neutralizing antibody from recovered patients. And in this study, just accepted by Lancet, uh, we use a combination of three drugs, the interferon beta, the Calitra, which is a drug used to treat HIV AIDS patients, and also the Vibavirin. So three drugs combined together, uh, three drugs combined together, and we show that this combination uh, produces a very marked decrease in the viral load by two to three loss between day six to day 11 after the onset of symptoms. Well, uh, we are very lucky to be able to find a triple combination uh, of drugs that can decrease the virus. But uh, how can we prepare for the next emerging virus without even knowing the virus? That is really important. And this is a paper that we published in Nature Communication last year, which we show that there is a broad spectrum antiviral called AM5 x 0 and its related compounds that can target the human uh, steroregulatory element binding protein. It, this protein is used by almost every respiratory viruses during the replication cycle. And of course, this compound can suppress both the SARS coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus, and also this SARS-CoV-2. And uh, we are now hoping to bring it into the next stage of development. But to test any new antiviral drugs or vaccines against COVID-19, we must have a good physiological small member model. And we have shown that the hamster is a very good model with severe symptoms, and it causes very severe pneumonia, and also a weight loss of around 10% uh, after challenge uh, within the first 10 days. So by giving the SARS coronavirus to um, Ha uh, to these hamsters, after the hamster recover, we get some of their serum and then give to newly challenged uh, hamsters. And we found that their lungs have a one lock decrease in the viral load. Uh, we showed that actually convalescent plasma or serum uh, from patients is likely to work. And of course, now we are using this small hamster model to test our vaccine. There are many kinds of COVID-19 vaccines under development. We are now making use of a non-virulent, life attenuated influenza vaccine, uh, virus vaccine, uh, based uh, vaccine platform for the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, what we did is very simple. Again, we are using this uh, spike receptor binding domain. We insert this uh, fragment of genes into one of the genes inside the influenza virus. We actually delete the virulence uh, gene and then replace it with this spike receptor binding domain uh, so that this virus also, uh, what we call the express as this protein receptor binding domain and induce the host immune response. And that would provide a dual protection against both the seasonal influenza and also the uh, SARS-CoV-19. We are now funded by the CEPI, uh, which is supported by the Gates Foundation. Uh, another group uh, in our department is making a DNA vaccine. And this DNA vaccine is uh, making use of the spike receptor binding domain again, uh, which is linked to the PB2. And that would augment the immune response a lot. And we believe that uh, in all our approaches, we are only making use of a fragment of protein from the surface spike. And that is very important because in previous animal study, it's shown that uh, if you use uh, many other parts of the virus 
uh, then you may induce immunopathology, which means that the vaccinee, the recipient of the vaccine, develop more disease after the vaccination. And that is very dangerous. So we are using a very safe approach uh, by uh, using only a fragment of the spike in making these vaccines. And now we are already finishing the animal experiments and we hope that uh, we can uh, put it in a phase one clinical trial as early as possible. Um, what can we do before we have a good vaccine? We didn't have, we, we are not having it yet. Uh, what makes this virus so transmissible? We found that within 215 returnees from the Princess Diamond uh, cruise ship, uh, nine were found, nine of them were found to have the virus infection during the quarantine in Hong Kong uh, after they returned to Hong Kong. But only six of them remained, uh, uh, six of them actually remained asymptomatic. Only one of them developed significant symptoms. The other two is very mild symptoms. Now, that means that there are a lot of silent or mild these cases in the community spreading the virus. So the priority is to stop these silent spreaders. How can we do that? Every country is using border control, extensive testing and isolation, contact tracing, quarantine, and social distancing. And in fact, uh, a few countries are actually doing more efficiently than Hong Kong. But what makes Hong Kong different? Our community-wide wearing of masks is perhaps one of the best in the world. During the rush hour in the streets, we count that around 97% of the Hong Kong people are wearing masks when they're going to work. And that is very important. Hong Kong actually has one of the world's lowest number of COVID-19 cases per million population. So at this stage in time, we are one of the best performer at this stage of the pandemic. And just to show you, that uh, with almost universal masking, uh, Hong Kong has the lowest, one of the lowest percentage of deaths and lowest incidence uh, per million population when compared to Singapore and South Korea. If you look at the number of local cases in Hong Kong, uh, especially those who are involved in clusters, uh, those which are related to mass off settings, like religious activity, dining, drinking, restaurant, bar, singing, karaoke, and exercise in gymnasium, uh, that involves around 100 people. But in terms of number of local cases related to mass on settings, such as workplace, only 11. And that shows that community-wide masking actually make Hong Kong better than any other places. And then in the long run, in order to combat emerging epidemics and also seasonal flu epidemics, I think we should consider that everyone should have a personalized, reusable epidemic combat kit. It should be made of self-disinfecting fabrics with arthropod repelling property and is washable and can be reused a hundred times. And of course, that should include a filter mask, a face shield, etc. And I believe that uh, our colleagues should be able to have a lot of innovation to make all these personalized and reusable epidemic combat kits possible. But Hong Kong should not be complacent and arrogant. In the 2003, just one super spreading event at the Emma Garden, due to the loss of the water trap between the floor drain and the subway system, caused over 200 severe SARS cases. As a result, paralyzed our hospital authority service. This time, we have a, we have a few transmission at the Hongmei house uh, due to the altered uh, plumbing of the vent pipe and the Hang Tai uh, house due to the weight effects uh, at the opening of the vent pipe uh, in the survey system. Can these 40 architectural designs be prevented? That is also an important question because one such super spreading event would be really fatal. For, last, for the last 17 years, the Hong Kong Youth Department of Microbiology has been tracking emerging infectious disease outbreaks in China. You can see that the Pearl River Delta has been affected by the birth flu H5N1 in 1997, and then the SARS coronavirus in 2003. Then in 2013, we have the uh, influenza A 
H7, N9 around the Yangtze River Delta. We believe that tackling this emerging epidemic infectious disease required uh, the organized technology to predict the potential species jumping viruses for preparedness. We need rapid multiplex and accurate diagnostic tests. We need broad spectrum antivirus and antibodies. And we need a universal vaccine and adjuvant platforms. Because you really cannot be 100% certain which virus is going to come next. Originally, our prediction of the next epidemic before 2019 would be uh, the Bohai Bay region, which is a coastal area, again, with a very high degree of social economic development. Well, but we are completely wrong this, uh, this time. And uh, it turns out that this pandemic is originating at the heart of China, Wuhan, where all the high speed rail air travel and with river routes meet at this point. So can you predict where, when, and what emerging infections causing pandemic can come next time so that we can all get prepared? I'm grateful to all my team members, my rapid response team members, uh, which consists of clinicians, clinical microbiologists, and basic scientists who closely collaborate with the hospital authority and the Department of Health. And salutes to all the frontline healthcare workers at the hospital authority and the Department of Health, and also thanks to the Hong Kong public for the cooperation with the epidemic control. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Yun. Uh, excellent talk, and we uh, uh, especially appreciate the fact that uh, you also gave an overview of uh, what your colleagues are also doing uh, in your faculty. Uh, in case you do not know, uh, right now there are about 300 people uh, listening. Um, well, a few questions have come in. Um, so the first one, um, using influenza virus backbone for COVID-19 vaccine production, would there be a risk of reassortment with wild-type influenza virus if it is used in a large scale? I think that is a theoretical list. Uh, as all the life attending virus uh, that has been used in the past, like the polio virus, etc., all have such a possibility. But our vaccine actually is having a deletion of the NS1 gene, which makes it replication deficient, which means that once it goes inside the cells, it only has one chance of replication inside that particular cell. So I must say the risk of the assortment is extremely low. I cannot say that it is impossible, but that possibility is basically very, very minimal. And the chance of it being assorted to get a more virulent virus it's uh, almost impossible because the virulence gene actually has gone. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is from a colleague, uh, Peng Gao. Uh, so he's asking, what is the main reason for severe case and death? I think one of the most important reasons is still the underlying problem. Uh, we all know that uh, OH, elderly patients more than 65 especially, uh, those with underlying medical comorbidities. That means that they have very severe underlying diseases to start with, especially diabetes, uh, hypertension, and also obesity. So important risk factor that uh, increase the risk of death. Of course, many under many other underlying diseases that suppress the immune system also predispose them to death. Um, there are many important reasons why the, this is so. But first is because uh, the, the underlying disease, such as heart disease or lung disease, will be exacerbated uh, when they have an infection. Once you have an infection, there's inflammation, your blood vessels tend to clot more easily. And so they have a more higher chance of death due to an exacerbation or precipitation of the underlying disease process. The second, of course, is that when the viral load is very high, even in very young patients uh, uh, with no underlying diseases, uh, very healthy, when the viral load goes to a very high level, it will actually stimulate our immune system so much that there are a lot of inflammation that occurs. And when you have a lot of inflammation, that could also kill you. 
uh, that occur uh, that occurs in a number of cases uh, which uh, may have some unknown genetic predisposition that we do not understand. So the important thing is to identify patients early, treat them early, so that the viral load doesn't increase to a high level, and even these sort of deaths can be prevented in the long run. And I hope that the triple combination of antivirals is going to do such a job before better antivirals appear. Well, I, I, I myself would like to follow up a bit on that. Uh, so many uh, who have uh, contracted the disease or have been tested uh, positive have rather light symptoms. Uh, so so um, what, what is the uh, statistics on uh, permanent damage? Because you show that uh, in some cases, the lungs are uh, uh, very much affected. So what is the statistics uh, for this disease that the pa a typical patient would have uh, permanent we, damage? We are now following around 200 patients at Premier Hospital. And we are regularly doing the lung function test. And we can only tell you this answer in around one year's time when we have followed them enough. Uh, the, the, I mean, this concern is very uh, real. Uh, you, have un you have asked a very important question. Uh, because uh, with such degree of lung damage, we are afraid the fibrosis of the lung may set in and that may impair the lung function of the patients in the long run. But at this stage in time, we do not know because we know uh, from other diseases that fibrosis can reverse in some circumstances. So uh, the amount of fibrosis that will occur would take quite a bit of time before I can tell you the answer. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Paul Hunt. Uh, the question is, the spike protein is cleaved and changes shape in the course of infection. So do we know if the spike fragments used in uh, vaccine trials remain intact and exposed throughout? Again, an excellent question. Um, we hope not. Uh, we hope that it would not uh, change as fast as in the case of influenza. But this is a real issue. And uh, of course, uh, we are not using a very small part of the receptor binding domain. We use the whole part of the receptor binding domain. And we know that there are neutralizing any body epitope on the surface, uh, which is multiple. It's not just a single site. So that in cases, it's just some mutation at one site. We hope that the other sites will be preserved. But at this stage in time, we have been able to find multiple neutralizing antibody epitopes. And but we also know that there are T cell epitopes, T lymphocyte epitopes uh, that can be protected. So uh, we have to be lucky. Um, if the virus is so smart as to mutate all the sites, uh, then we have to uh, change our vaccine uh, to another formulation using the newly formed, uh, uh, newly mutated receptor binding domain in order to get enough protection. And which means that that is very bad. It will be like seasonal influenza that you have to immunize the population every every year in order to get maximum protection. I hope that that scenario would not uh, happen. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, this is a question from uh, JD Huang. I think he's our colleague. So he's asking, will the influenza virus-based COVID-19 vaccine be effective for individuals who had been infected by influenza virus or vaccinated by flu vaccines before? Um, that is another uh, real concern, but uh, you know very well that uh, every year uh, we change the vaccine uh, so that uh, you use a different seasonal vaccine uh, for the production every year. So as long as we use the backbone, which is required by WHO, uh, uh, then we put in this receptor binding domain, uh, we can re-immunize the patient every year. Uh, but this time it is for dual protection, not just for the seasonal influenza, but also for this coronavirus. And of course, if that is indeed necessary, uh, our vaccine is the perfect vaccine because uh, it is produced every year uh, by all countries. And we know that there are already life attenuated influenza vaccine uh, that is on the market uh, by the MediMill. And uh, we hope that our vaccine can do even a better job than what is now on the market. Right. This one, obviously, I think you have been asked a lot in the government. Uh, what is your view towards the proposal of resuming school in mid-May? We can always resume, except that you must prepare well. All right. If you don't prepare everybody well and let the children go to school, that is highly dangerous. So it has to be a staged approach 
starting from the university and secondary schools and see what happened first. And we must uh, get all the uh, important hygienic measures in place and children has to be very well uh, taught, educated on how to uh, really comply with all the personal protection measures, how to wear masks already, how to do frequent hand hygiene, uh, how to declare their health status. And of course, uh, 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 we have to ask them to really uh, not to uh, embrace exchanging their saliva and uh, nasal secretions because children, when they come together, they always forget all about the personal hygiene. Uh, so a lot of supervision, a lot of preparedness before the schools can be resumed, especially for primary and kindergarten. All right, perhaps one or two more questions. Uh, this is from Arthur Pang. He's asking, what is the rate of mutation of the new COVID-19 virus and will this affect vaccine development efforts? The, actually, the rate of mutation is very similar to all the other coronaviruses. Uh, it's fast. But uh, judging from what we know about uh, coronaviruses in general, uh, it is less, I mean, at least at this stage in time, it is less likely to be as bad as influenza. Influenza is uh, influenza, HIV, and HCV are the fastest. Uh, I think uh, we need to watch, they need to monitor. But uh, it's too early at this stage in time to say that it's just as bad as influenza. All right, uh, may maybe the last one because there are a lot of interesting questions, but we don't have time for all those. So this is from a student called Adelaide. Uh, so you mentioned intensive testing as one of the e essential measures other than social distancing. How would you comment on the scale of testing being done in the community thus far, uh, whether this is being adequate? Thank you, Adelaide. Um, I think we have been trying our best already, but uh, our, our maximum capacity at this stage in time is less than 5,000. And I think that is actually not enough. Uh, because we want all the mild cases to be tested. Uh, but that has not yet happened. Uh, we hope that it can be augmented uh, when more universities and also private uh, the diagnostic laboratory are able to join the testing. And I am sure that the chief executive and also the Professor Sylvia Chen is trying their best uh, to make this happen. Uh, we, Hong Kong U, has been joining the, the testing and hope that in a few months' time, we can go up to 7,000 testing per month, which is almost uh, uh, as best as the United States or, or other parts of the world. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Yun. We have.